in song as we're looking at the gospel that was the gospel in song right there if you have your bibles would you turn to acts chapter 15 acts chapter 15 this morning we're going to begin in just a moment in verse one uh, as you're turning there you know along with the great spiritual and ministry experiences of my personal short-term mission trips there have also been uh, some personal special experiences also when you're ever in a different part of the country or a different part of the world you want to experience some of that one of the memorable experiences for instance in brazil uh, we had the opportunity i as well as a number of members of the team i think danny was a part of that we were able to straddle the equator so at one time I was in both the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, and there's not ever been a time, uh, there's a picture of that, I would love to find it uh, somewhere. Uh, also, when I've had a couple of opportunities to go to Africa, and I remember some of those experiences flying uh, above Kenya, flying into Africa, and flying over Mount Kilimanjaro, and seeing snow-capped mountains in Africa, something that I thought wasn't possible, but indeed I saw it with my own eyes. That flight was much more comfortable, though, than one I would experience a few days uh, later as I was flying in a small, about 20-passenger plane over what was described as the most shark-infested uh, territory in all of the world. And I'm sitting there, and this plane's going, room, 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 and I'm thinking, please, please, Lord, don't. Don't let it go down. In Southeast Asia, having the opportunity to uh, visit uh, a submarine, having the opportunity to be through a walking zoo and actually see an Indian cobra. This was a walking zoo, but there most certainly was a barricade between me uh, and that dangerous snake. But there's so many special experiences. But you know, on most personal short-term mission trips, if you've ever been on one of these, you can attest to it. You work hard for numbers of days, and then usually whether it's one out of seven or one out of 10 days, you do take a little break to just experience the area. One of my biggest regrets, what I missed out on sharing with my youngest son, John Mark, happened actually in Vermont. And I'm a little jealous of Mike and Terry because as I remember it, I think they took in that experience. But they went to, I believe, what was called the Blue Bend Diner, which is one of the top 10 diners in the entire United States. And I just chose to eat at another place because it was easier to get to. I regret that. But you know, there's so many experiences. Last week, we were uh, talking outside the churchyard about what a bonding time it is. I mean, it is fun to go and do the Lord's work in another part of the United States or in other countries. But I will not lie. I look forward to coming home. Usually by the end of that trip, like the, the next to last day, I'm the one, I'm getting everything in order, I'm getting things packed, and I'm ready to get home because there's nothing like being in the same house with my wife, with my family, eating the food that I'm comfortable with, reclining in my recliner, sleeping in my bed. I look forward, and once we get on that van or plane or whatever it is, I am ready to get back home. It's something about that. Today, we're looking in Acts chapter 15. And Antioch was not home to Paul and Barnabas, but Antioch of Syria was the sending church on their first missionary journey. And so for the past six weeks, we've looked at Paul's first missionary journey, and now the trip is completed. Now, it was short term, but not by our definition. It was not a week or two week trip. It actually was almost a year. And so you can imagine the excitement that Paul and Barnabas had as they were returning to Antioch of Syria, the sending church, and they were excited about sharing with them. There were familiar faces, familiar places. And so while it was not literally home for them, in a way, it was like coming back to a home church. Look with me in Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. It says, some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers. Now, these men had come from Judea, even though it was south geographically, topographically, it was they came from the higher lands of Judea, and they came to Antioch. And so Paul was there, as we see 
see at the end of chapter 14, and, and in the midst of this party and celebration, there were the naysayers. And so they said, unless you're circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. In other words, Paul and Barnabas and the team, they had reached a number of Gentiles. And so there was an issue of what are we going to do with these people who are not by nature Jews, who are not born Jews, how can they be saved? Well, Paul and Barnabas, verse 2, had engaged them in serious argument and debate. Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed at that time to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about the issue. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all the brothers and sisters. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, and they reported all God had done with them. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, it's necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders gathered to consider the matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up in them and said to them, brothers, you're aware that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' neck that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way they are. The whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describe all the wonders and signs God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they stopped speaking, James responded, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this as it is written, after these things I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name declares the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, James said, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God, but instead we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from, from blood. For since ancient times, Moses had had those who proclaim him in every city and every Sabbath day he is read aloud in the synagogues. Let's pray. Lord, as we look to your word today, we thank you, Lord, for the success of the gospel message. How in this first journey that um, Paul and Barnabas and the team with the blessing of the church at Antioch carried the gospel. And Lord, as we follow that trail some 2,000 years, Lord, we're, we're the the beneficiaries of that. We're the ones who have been blessed through that because the gospel did not stop, Lord, in Jerusalem. Help us to continue to carry the gospel. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We see at the end of Acts chapter 14, indeed, that Paul and Barnabas had returned to Antioch of Syria, and there was a real celebration. There was a lot of joy. Every church that sends out a short-term mission team would love to hear an exciting report, not that the van broke down, which sometimes can happen, we know, not that things like that will happen, but actually that people were converted to the faith. And so Paul and Barnabas, they came back here to the sending church. They appreciated. Our, our brother Gary, who is on mission, um, is, has already been texting this week, sharing about the exciting news. We look forward to hear, uh, hearing more of what is going on. And so they were back, Paul and Barnabas, they were in Antioch, and everything was going well. But as we've seen throughout the first journey, there were some people who were with them, and there were some people who were against them. And so very soon we see in Acts chapter 15 and verse 1 that there was a group group 
a group of naysayers. They had come uh, from uh, Judea, in all likelihood from Jerusalem. They came into the church while the celebration was going on, and they began to reign on that parade. Well, today uh, we're going to look at what uh, Paul and Barnabas' report was. We're going to see that after they finished the journey, there was still one more journey they would have to take. They would move from Antioch to Jerusalem, where the apostles and the elders who were recognized as authorities in the matter, the apostles having been hand chosen by the Lord Jesus himself, the elders, reputable leaders with discernment, guided by the Holy Spirit and guided by God, they decided to make the trip from Antioch to Jerusalem, and we're going to see what that decision was. But before we get there, the first thing we need to see this morning is the issue. And the issue was this for the Jews. Can a believer actually be a believer yet be uncircumcised. And so we see that things were going great until this one group came in and said, there's a problem here. Uh, and as we open chapter 15, we see that they have made their trip from Judea and they begin to challenge the conversions of these Gentiles. In effect, what they were saying, it isn't enough, it is not enough for them, they were saying, to believe in Jesus. That is good, but they must add to that certain parts of the Jewish law. Now, we know elsewhere they're described as Judaizers. In this group, it says here they had embraced the gospel, but they did not understand the gospel. And so they were trying to amend they were trying to add to the gospel. And so it says in verse 1 that they went about and they taught, unless you're circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. So they were saying faith in Jesus Christ is not alone, alone is not enough. Now that's a problem. Because we see here that they were confused and they were confusing others. That's why doctrine is so important in the church. That's why it's important that we go to the Word of God and study the Word of God and not teach the traditions of man, but teach the authority of the Word of God. And so they were confused. They were confusing others. While they had embraced Jesus Christ, they began to impose on the Christian faith their own goals, their own thoughts. And Paul said this is a problem. In fact, he said in, in Galatians chapter 1, I believe around verse 8, he says that even if I or an angel from God were to proclaim to you a gospel which is different from this gospel, let that one be accursed. And so the late John Stott, in speaking about this interference here in Antioch by these Judaizers, said this, their message was was this, Moses must complete what Jesus has done. That's false. That's anathema. Moses can't complete. Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses. Moses doesn't fulfill the salvation work of Jesus. They had it all wrong. And the point is this, Satan detests the gospel. He detests it. He detests it because, as it says in Romans 1, it is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. So it is the power of God, but the power, we saw today the power of God in the burning bush that was not consumed. But that power is not a limited power. God's power of the gospel was not limited to the Jews. It was to begin with the Jews, but it was to go to the Gentiles. And the devil hates that. That's why when a church begins to reach people for Christ, you can almost be having your head on a swivel looking for everything that he can throw at the wall to try to stick. And there are really two ways that Satan tries to thwart gospel advancement. One is overtly, just directly. We've already seen that in the past few weeks, persecution. Uh, Paul was stoned. He was threatened. He was chased out of cities. Those cities that we saw last week, he actually came back to fearlessly to preach the gospel. And really, so as Satan was trying to overtly work against uh, the gospel, it really wasn't working. But there's another strategy he has, and it's this, covertly. 
These individuals were described as believers, but they were believers who had not developed an understanding of the true gospel, and they were very dangerous. That's why we don't put a new convert immediately in a leadership position in the church. It's a dangerous thing because many times their doctrine, their theology does not catch up with their personal experience. And so these people were coming in and they were trying to tweak the gospel. In fact, they weren't throwing stones. They probably came in with great pomp and great circumstance, uh, appearing to be an authority, trying to confuse the message. And it was very dangerous. You see, to add to the gospel is to change it. To add one to the number three is not three, it is four. And so anyone who would come to you and say, faith in Jesus Christ is not enough, that you must add the law, that you must do something to it, they're wrong. And so this wasn't a minor issue in the church. I mean, this is very early in the church. And Paul and Barnabas, and we're going to see Peter, they understood it was so serious that it needed to be set straight at the beginning. Have you ever played that great game? I think it's called Rumor. People sit around, maybe it's 25 people in a room, and someone says, like, Mrs. Brown took a green truck to the red house, and before it was Miss Brown took a red tree to the greenhouse. It gets to the end and it's all turned around and you try to figure out where did it get messed up? Who didn't hear right? Don't ever have someone hard of hearing playing that game. <laughs> but the problem here is if you get it wrong at the beginning, you most certainly will have it wrong at the end. And so now as the church is young, as the gospel is moving from the Jews to the Gentiles, it was such a serious matter that they decided to take the issue to the apostles in Jerusalem. And it says in verse 2 that the disagreement, literally it says, it was not a little. It wasn't a little. It was a big thing. And so they traveled to Jerusalem. And, and then it says in verse 3, as they were traveling, they didn't let the naysayers, those who were adding confusion to hinder their enthusiasm. It said as they were going through Phoenicia and Samaria, they were saying, listen to what's happening. The gospel is going beyond Jerusalem, going beyond Samaria. It's going to the Gentiles. It said the people were rejoicing. And even when they arrived in Jerusalem, there was a welcoming committee there. They were excited. The apostles and the elders welcomed them in the church. But as we have seen, hold on, because here comes the devil. The devil has his group. These Pharisees who were naysayers, we don't know if it's the same group who basically followed them in, the very same individuals, or a representative party that believed the same thing, but they came and notice what they said. The same thing that those in Antioch had said in verse one, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And so here the gospel is advancing. People are excited. Even the apostles and elders were excited, but there were people challenging the message that was being proclaimed. You know, as we look at the gospel, it's important that as the gospel advances, that it also be defended. Because as the gospel advances, it, it infringes upon what the devil's work is. And you can be certain that there'll be a kickback against it. And so we see that Paul and Barnabas and Peter, they were advancing the gospel, but they were also at the same time defending it. It almost reminds you of Nehemiah when he was building the wall, had one hand doing the work of the wall, but some of them had another hand with a sword to defend the wall. And so the gospel is this, and this is important, so important that they took this trip very early. The gospel is this, every one of us is a sinner, every single one of us, if not in thought and word, if not in thought and word and action, if not in thought and word and action in attitude, the Bible says that we have all fallen short. And there is only one payment for your sin and my sin, and that is Jesus Christ who died on the cross. He came to Calvary to die for us, and he arose from the grave. 
And the Bible calls us to repent and to believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder if you've done that today. That, that message that is defended is the message of life. Well, I want you to see in verses 6 through 12, the witness of Peter and Paul and Barnabas. We know Paul and Barnabas had a story because we've looked at it the last few weeks in Acts 13 and 14, but Peter has a story too. And it was great that Peter was an advocate. I shared this a few years ago, but it's an amusing story. When you've been here 30 some years, you'll hear some repeat stories. So I, I'll just say that. But my <clears throat> college roommate, Andy Gray, uh, is one of my dear friends. He loves to come down and visit from time to time. And Andy, I would tell him to his face, he's stubborn. You don't tell Andy no. He is one of the most determined people I've ever known. Well, a few years ago, he was driving through my hometown of Appomattox. He had graduated from Hamden, Sydney, and he got a speeding ticket. Now, I'll be honest, if I get a speeding ticket, I will just say, well, I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to pay the the ticket and save the hour. And that's if I live across town. Well, Andy was in Northern Virginia and he said, I'm going to go to court just in case I can fight this thing. So I said, you have at it. He said, but Caldwell, I want you to go with me. And so I've been away from mathematics for a while. And so I went back. If you've heard this story, you know where I'm going. We arrive in the courtroom and we see old man Watt Abbott. And old man Watt Abbott was a friend of mine. But he's a, he was a friend of everybody, you know. So I didn't think that much of it. And so I introduced Mr. Abbott. He passed away a number of years ago to Andy. And I said, this is my college roommate, Andy Gray. He, he's about five years removed from college, but he still has a heavy foot. And he drove too fast and was caught speeding. Well, we, we uh, just shared some, some talk for a brief time. And then Andy and I went and sat and... and and waited for his case to come up. His, his case came up in traffic court, and Andy stood before the judge. And before the judge or Andy could say anything, old man Watt Abbott came up, stood by Andy, and said, this is a friend of a friend, an old Hampton, Sydney student, and a fine young man. And that's all he said. Andy got out of there only paying the court cost. <laughs> Paul and Barnabas we're in a situation, they were standing before a council that was going to make judgment. And when they looked over and saw Peter, I mean, that was like old man Watt Abbott. Because I'm sure the two of them, they felt, man, we're the ones who've experienced this. We were on the trip. There's no way we can describe what's happening to the trip to them. And then Peter stands up. Verse 7 says that's exactly what he did in this assembly. There had been much debate, and then Peter speaks. And when he speaks, he really said five things in defense of Paul and Barnabas in their ministry. First, he said that he, Peter, had personally witnessed to the Gentiles. And he said, and you know about it. In fact, he said, by my mouth, in verse 7, the Gentiles have heard. In other words, we know about his experience with Cornelius and how God called Peter to go to Cornelius' house. That was a significant movement of the gospel as it was advancing to the people. And Peter said, I can tell you, I've seen God work and I've seen Gentiles believe. He also made it clear that this wasn't of him. It was ordained by God. He didn't just wake up one day uh, and say, I think I'm going to go talk to Cornelius. No, he said, God made a choice among you. I did this at the prompting of God. I myself. And then he adds in verse eight, it was a work of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 8. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving him the Holy Spirit. In other words, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. In other words, what he said is the Holy Spirit coming into their lives is proof that their conversion was genuine. But he didn't stop there because he says, just as he also did to us. You notice what Peter said there? They're, they're like we are. We're nothing special. We're not distinct from them. Verse 9, he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts, what? By faith in Jesus Christ, the inward work of Christ. But then he adds on to that. To add anything to that was to weigh them down 
unnecessarily. Verse 10, now then why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors or we were able to? To bear. In other words, he says, why, Judaizers, are you doing this? The gospel is advancing. Jesus is being glorified. You're trying to take people back to the Mosaic way. Why are you hindering gospel advancement? Why take those who have been free and put them in a yoke of bondage? I like how Albert Barnes explains verse 11. He says, these additives, far from being necessary to their salvation, are really of no use to ours, is, is how he's uh, uh, really explaining what Peter is saying there. So after Peter spoke, I'm sure Paul and Barnabas felt great. And so they began to share how God had converted the Gentiles, how there were signs and wonders which were proof of God's work. And then we come to really the crux of the matter in verses 13 through 21. And that, that is the ruling of the Jerusalem Council. Now, the Jerusalem Council was not just a local town council. It was not just a group of leaders that everybody thought, well, they have great abilities. Let's just put them in leadership. No, the apostles were hand chosen by the Lord himself. The elders proved themselves as being right doctrinally. So they were the ones to listen to the defense of these three men. James, the brother of Jesus, the blood brother of Jesus, was the leader of this group. He noted a couple of things. He noted Peter's testimony. He validated it. And then also he took them into the Old Testament. And so he says... Um, he said, verse 14, Simeon, which that is another way of saying Peter reported. That's the testimony. But then he says, and the words of the prophet agree with this. What is he saying? The word of God. Because the words of the prophet, the Old Testament, were considered authoritative. And so as we look at the gospel, if someone says something and it's contrary to what the Bible says about the gospel, it's, it's a false additive. It's a false teaching. And so notice what he says in verse 16 as he goes to the prophets. He says, uh, prophesying from 8th century prophets that lived 750, 800 years before that, Amos and Isaiah, after these things, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. What is he speaking about there? The, the destruction of Jerusalem, the uh, exile into Babylon. But he's saying after that, I'm going to rebuild it. That's why I believe God still has a plan for the nation of Israel. There's a remnant here. There's going to be a massive turning, I believe, of Israel to the Lord. But he says, I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again. But notice the purpose Verse 17, so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord. It wasn't that Israel would say, oh, we're special. Oh, we're this and pat themselves on the back. But God's purpose was that the gospel get to the Gentiles through the Jews, through the Jews that they proclaim it. And so God would restore Israel, but he would restore Israel so that everyone would hear. And the point is this. Israel and the Judaizers identified themselves as Israelites. They were not to be resistors, but conduits of the gospel. And that's why it's such an important issue. He's saying don't stop the flow of the gospel by adding to the gospel what is not consistent, but be a conduit of it. Don't hinder the people from coming, but allow them to come. So we see the council made a decision. They made a decision that the work should not be hindered, that Christ alone, faith in Christ alone is enough. But then you say, but, but look at what it says in verse 20. But instead, we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from blood. So in, in one way, we see the councils just saying faith in Christ is alone, alone is enough. But then he says, but let's look at these three things. Let's add these three things. Now, it's very important. He didn't say add these three things as essential. It's just that we write to them that they abstain. Two of the things were part of the ceremonial law, abstaining from things polluted by idols, 
They were considered to be unclean and from eating anything that has been strangled and from blood. One of them is a moral law. Uh, abstain from sexual immorality. That is a timeless moral law. A Christian should not be engaged in sexual immorality. We understand that. But what about these two ceremonial laws? There are two things that we need to bring out. The first is this. They were not listed as essential to salvation. Basically, they were emphasized as things that would benefit these believers. It would be bad for them to get caught back into idolatry. It would be bad for them to neglect God in that. But also, as the gospel was going to the Gentile people, there would be Jews that would be involved in that. And, and, and the council, I believe very wisely under the leadership of God here, understood let's not hinder the advancement of the gospel. In fact, we're going to see uh, after my surgery, we get back next year, Lord willing, in January in the second missionary journey, that is Paul, who separates from Barnabas and starts off with Silas, he brings in young Timothy, and what does he do? Because he comes from a family that had a mother that was a Jew, father that was Gentile, he had him circumcised. And so Paul had spent all of this time emphasizing circumcision is not essential to salvation. It is not. But it was essential that the work not be hindered. You see, he didn't want to be a stumbling block to the Jews so that this issue would continue to come up and be a quagmire. He wanted to allow the gospel to flow freely. So the counsel was clear itself. It is faith in Christ alone. But our advice, our command is in the sake of the advancement of the gospel that they avoid these three things. So where does that bring us? The early church was very clear. Paul, Barnabas, men sent out by God. And Apostle Peter, who personally was commissioned by God, Paul himself commissioned by God, said this, the way a person is saved is through faith in Jesus alone. Paul says in Galatians elsewhere, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, Christ died in vain. In other words, if I could get to heaven by what I do and what laws I keep, then why would God have sent Jesus to die? You see that? Paul said that. It is faith in Christ alone. So here at the beginning of gospel advancement, it was very clear how a person is saved. We know that it's going to be attacked. The gospel message itself, whether it be overtly, covertly, there's going to be those who are against it. But make no mistake, it has always been and always will be through Jesus Christ. The Old Testament saints, they were saved through faith in Christ. They may not have looked back the way we did, but just like I can go to the store and put down that credit card and say the payment's coming later, the payment for the Old Testament uh, saints, that payment came later when Jesus died. The question today is this, have you received the payment of Christ in your life or have you rejected it? If you come to God and say, God, I'm a sinner, there's nothing I bring to the table. I need Jesus Christ. I repent of my sin and I believe in Jesus as the only way. Lord, there's nothing more I need other than the payment. There's nothing more I can pay. He paid fully. He paid sufficiently. Today, would you come and say, I'm a sinner that needs that salvation. Let's pray. Father, as we have looked to your word, we thank you that very early in the life of the church, the home base, the Jerusalem church, made up of men directly commissioned by you and elders fully led by you, made it very clear that a person is saved through faith in Christ and through faith in Christ alone. If there be any here today who have not believed on you, I pray there would be a stirring in his or her soul that today would be the day of salvation. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.